The English did not invent cricket. Cricket is divine. The home of cricket in Marylebone, London, is called Lords. The players assemble in the Lords Pavilion. They are dressed in white. The proceedings are governed by laws. There is a vast law book for different forms and levels of the proceedings. Few study this law book. England's first cricket hero was called Grace. A fine batsman I bowled against at Beedales wrote a biography of him called Amazing Grace, and Amazing Grace played at Lords for England. Cricket is not only divine; it's an art form. Which is just as well, because the Sparks generations have exhibited themselves as having any skill only in art forms. Ask them to do anything else, and you might as well talk to a piano, or a pencil, or a paintbrush, or of course a cricket bat. The English did not, as mythologized, invent cricket; they merely discovered it. God, at the beginning, on the sixth day of creation, having already put it in the minds of men and women, God invented it for us. We merely had to discover what He had written into our minds and hearts, and that happened here in England, just up the road from here, in fact, in Hambledon, Hampshire. So cricket writers say, the cradle of cricket. Here in England, cricket and the village green are an expression of Englishness, and its blue-skied, swallow-filled, twittering summer, the clonk of a leather ball against a wooden bat, pointless shouts by fielders to encourage bowlers, the groans of fielders at near misses, faces in hands as if they have had a vision of the final horror. Here, where men sit and hear each other groan, John Keats. Cricket is the king of sports and the sport of kings, but not only of kings. I remember a book of cricket cartoons that was given to my father. One cartoon showed a train stopped alongside a cricket match, with a scoreboard showing a huge score, and the driver, having deserted his train. And with his sleeves rolled up over blacksmith's forearms, and walking onto the pitch and demanding to be given the ball, and expressing something uncouth about how he would so and so shift that so and so batsman. Another cartoon in the book shows a young fellow just going out to bat, and his girlfriend in short skirt, tight revealing top and long eyelashes, is saying to him. Oh, darling, don't be long. You have to understand cricket to understand that. During the war, my mother was scorer for the army cricket team. My father played in the Birmingham League, about which I have a book inherited from him, showing him playing alongside and against international names. He told me he scored eighty off Harold Larwood. If you don't know who Harold Larwood is, the name is worth looking up. At Teachers Training College, my mother liked the look of the cricket captain. She asked him if the team had a scorer. He said no, and she told how she'd been scorer for the army. He accepted her offer, and she accepted his and married her, but not in the cricket season, by mutual consent. At the end of October, my mother, as a child, the oldest of four girls, would get away from her three younger sisters, an avoidance she continued into later life, by walking to the library and reading books on cricket and field placings and its laws. Don't say rules; they're called laws. It's naff to call them rules. She and my father had been to some of the same matches at Edgbaston. They'd seen the great Don Bradman. My father's coach was Eric Hollies, who bowled Bradman out for naught in his final Test appearance. 
preventing him from the four he needed to end his test career with an all-time batting average of 100. Eric Hollies told my father, On the field of play you play your hardest to win as a compliment to your opponent, but afterwards it doesn't matter a damn who won or lost. Dad had autograph books with great names, including Sir Jack Hobbs, the highest scorer ever of first-class hundreds, 198 of them. Hobbs was a Christian and never had any scandal attached to his name. Hobbs was humble by birth, noble by character. He was my father's hero. When my father died, I asked my mother about those autograph books. Oh, I didn't think you'd want those. She had thrown them out, along with score books I also wanted, which included my nine wickets for 20 runs for Petersfield against Alton. Only my word for that remains. I bowled slow left-arm cutters, later turning to spin, and batted at four. I like to bat at four because you get a look at the bowling before two wickets fall. My brother Martin and I were born with cricket bats in our hands. The earliest cine film I have is the family playing cricket in the back garden of our terraced house at 13 East Lake Close, Birmingham. Martin is just about old enough to stand. Martin and I played cricket everywhere. In the garden, in the hall, in the living room, in the kitchen, in the bedrooms, along the upstairs corridor, at the recreation ground, on the tennis court, on the local heathland, at the side of the local cricket pitch. Martin was Ted Dexter, England captain, and I was Neil Harvey, an Australian left-hander. Martin's initials were MJS. His cricket coach at school thought he was a future captain of England, another MJS, after MJ Smith, the bespectacled Warwickshire batsman and England captain. From essayists, poets and lyricists, comics and statistic nerds, and journalists, cricket has attracted quality literature, both in prose and poetry, just like trout and game fishing. I'm prone to an enjoyment of the mystery of cricket statistics. In 1974, my good friend Steve and I were walking from the England cricket team's hotel in Kingston, Jamaica, towards Sabina Park, where England were playing in a test match against West Indies. A van pulled up and a face leaned out of the window and a Jamaican accent asked, Where you boys going? To the test match. Well, you better jump in. You white boys shouldn't be walking out round here on your own. We could see a few white faces in the van and we trusted him. We jumped in. There in the van was half the England cricket team. So when the van went through the entry gate at Sabina Park, crowds of fans were staring in at the van, the closest I ever got to playing for England. In the warm-up match, MCC against Jamaica, Geoffrey Boycott had scored 261. In the test match, his opening batting partner, Dennis Amos, scored 262. One Saturday morning in the summer of 1976, I bumped into my girlfriend in the market. We hadn't made any arrangement, so we agreed that she would come round in the afternoon. England were playing West Indies, and when she arrived, Dennis Amos was batting. I said we'd go out when Dennis Amos was dismissed. He scored 202. Shortly after that, I was dismissed. Adios mi corazón. Goodbye my heart. Cricket has its own terminology, its meta language. This is a sacred language. How's that? Slip. Third man. Leg by. By. Square leg. Turned a mile. Golden duck. Maiden over. Cover point. LBW. A friend recently showed me a cricket book with some of this terminology translated into French. As that, ça va? 
slip, négligé. Third man, troisième homme. Bye, au revoir, leg bye, jambe au revoir. Square leg, jambe traditionnelle. Bowler, chapeau formel. He turned that a mile. Il l'a tourné mille six cent et neuf kilomètres. Maiden over, jeune fille fini. Golden duck, canard d'or. I was once a Tarrander with my mother watching Sussex against Hampshire. Seated among nerds with their biros and scorecards, she asked me, Is this Ian Salisbury bowling? I said, No, Mum, this is Cardigan Connor. Ian Salisbury is a slow bowler, and he's white and plays for Sussex. Cardigan Connor's a fast bowler, and he's black and plays for Hampshire. But she loved cricket and understood it. It was to Arundel that I took my former wife on our first afternoon out together. She did not come from a sporting family. She wanted to understand the LBW law. If it hits the pads and the umpire considers it would have hit the wicket, the batsman is given out. What if the ball hits the batsman's head? If it's in front of the wicket, he'd be given out. What about his shoulder? Out. What about if it hits the bat? Oh dear, I should have known. I've written plenty about trout fishing and bird watching, but only a handful of things about cricket. Just after my mother died in 2003, I had poems accepted for the MCC anthology of cricket verse, A Breathless Hush. The day of the launch of the anthology at Lord's Cricket Ground in 2004 was the day before the West Indies were due to take on England in a test match. West Indies took a day off instead of training. Rob Key got 221 for England. When I arrived, the entire ground was empty, not a soul around, and I had the cheek, my only ever chance, to have the famed lords all to myself and to walk out onto the sacred pitch and look at the holy grass and empty stands. And I looked at the pavilion steps, imagining the cri cricket gods, and my nerves jangled up my spine. How I would have loved... W. G. Grace, Jack Hobbs, Victor Trumper, Don Bradman, Gary Sobers, Richie Benno, Keith Miller, Dennis Lilly and his bowling partner Jeff Thompson, Ian Botham. I heard the legend Richie Benno say he asked Jeff Thompson about his perfect bowling action, had he developed and perfected it. Thompson answered, I'll just run up and go wang. Another mistake commonly made about cricket is to say that it's a microcosm of life. Cricket is not a microcosm of life. Life is a microcosm of cricket. This is one of my poems in that anthology, A Breathless Hush, the MCC Anthology of Cricket Verse. My poem is called The Plunderer. The whole of life's a net. You never make it to the middle. For death, the international harvester, who's never lost its form, has roped it off. Everything is pitched against the batsman. With one arm raised and death's round eye aiming down the barrel of its shoulder, death has fixed its all uprooting eye on every innings. Only God and love can ever be not out. So we take our death-defying guard, and crooked and hunchbacked at the crease, we make our timid stance, and hook the loose deliveries at the mesh. But when you think you've sorted out its googlies, flight and swerve, and the more you're sure that you're entrenched, and think you've seen it off, death rolls up its sleeves, marks the turf out with its spiky boots, and death runs up and sprays a Yorker through the gate. 
For death, when it's decided, bowls flat out and never misses. No wonder how we cherish, for a thin applause, every glance and pull, there being no refund till the grave to which the death cart rumbles with its bells and pale flags and ensigns on the ropes and tents of every ground. Life's already got its finger up, the donkey drops are few. Yet undeterred but nerved, we make our crossbat hoiks and drives and swipes outside the on and off till the ghostly umpire calls us out and the scorer chronicles your deeds. And unless the not-out infinite has heard your call and is ready with the stretcher, and unless we enter through the narrow wicket to the Lord's pavilion, then we've had it middle stump until the second innings afterwards. That rattle, the stumps spring back, another puts the whites on, then the gloves, death's wide gates invite the crowd, then it takes collections round the boundary. That fittingly is the very last poem in that anthology. The launch of the anthology was the only time I have ever been in the famous long room at Lord's. The way I got into the anthology was by a fortunate meeting with Hubert Doggart, who played for England in two test matches against West Indies. I think he dropped a serious catch and wasn't picked again. Life ready with its finger up. I met him in a match at Arundel. I wrote that poem in 1983, the year I retired from cricket. Too early now, I think. I sent it to my cricket captain. When he purchased the MCC anthology, he was surprised to find me in it. He shouldn't have been. I had a reputation as a dreamy fielder, thinking in the longer grass of poetry and song lyrics. I had a long throw, so it was good to put me out on the boundary anyway. I faced the great Keith Miller at Arundel with a tennis ball. On the outfield, two balls. I was about twelve. Then he walked off with Dennis Compton, and Martin and I continued our game. A poem about Arundel. Arundel Cricket Ground in Winter A day togged in its winter whites, the pavilion roof is covered in a thatch of snow and the all-white rhododendron bushes make the draped appearance of marquees. A castle turret is sprinkled in white powder like a set of giant stumps. The river Arran flows black down in the valley, and I wander in this Eden of all cricket gardens, its boundary, banks and slopes, the gap between the trees, and in the snow I'm dragging footprints like a bowler's run-up. I ascend the player's wooden steps, a batsman for whom no one claps and no scoreboard rattles metal numbers. As I stand underneath the pavilion clock, there comes to me the faint sound of a cello somewhere. Snow twirls in a summer wine glass, in flakes like light reflected, and I see it all again, the flickering images of decades past. Randall, Parks and Border, Hooper, Warne and Latchman. And when Steve Waugh on 94 in the over before tea lunged a skying six that clattered on the pavilion roof to get his hundred. I hear my mother's voice where we'd sit the day out with our egg sandwiches and salad beside the score box which seems like some peculiar obelisk in this snow. And I remember how one afternoon we took each other's photographs in front of the pavilion, me knowing, even as we clicked, that everything would one day come to this.
Cricket has never gone away, and it never will. I woke with a dream a few years ago of batting against the great Shane Warne. I would love to have done that. I would love to do it even now, were Warne alive. Cricket and squash and tennis and cycling kept me and Martin physically healthy and away from the interest of the drug scene, which was all around me in the 1970s. Besides which, I thought the drug scene was all a big affectation and wet. All that was for the sissies who couldn't play cricket and were scared of the hard ball. That's what Martin and I thought. Martin was something of a prodigy in school cricket. He scored 50 and tumbled a few stumps over every week. He certainly had a lively eye. He and a friend were having fielding practice together. Martin was teasing his friend at any dropped catch. The friend, understandably vexed, Martin was a ruthless tease, picked the ball up and shouted, Right, Spark, catch this! and hurled the leather ball at Martin's face as hard as he could. Martin put out a hand and the ball stuck. He came home laughing his head off. In one way, back then, we could call ourselves professional cricketers. Our father would give us extra pocket money if we scored 50 or took five wickets. He had an expensive weekend when Martin and I played at Bournemouth. I took five wickets for 16 and scored 72 not out. Martin scored 60-something. Such funds would have secured money for our fishing rods, angling in Kettlebrook, our stream of consciousness, where the little trout twitched their cold lives away. I rode the National Road Race Cycling Championship, had a letter about the Olympics, and packed it up. I didn't want to spend my life riding a bike. Playing cricket is what I wanted to do, and squash in the winter, both in the county league system. When my brother Martin and I were children, we just took it for granted that we were going to play cricket for England. I never thought of doing anything else. But it was all just a childish fantasy. We never actually did anything about it, just held that idle dream in the head. Not that we would have made it. I might have cycled for England, but I didn't want to do that. Dreaming of playing cricket for England, silly as it might have been, did me a very great favour. It saved me from any serious thought about careers. I remember walking out of the careers office at school after an interview with the woodwork teacher. The only thing I was curious about was the architectural structure of his office. I didn't mind too much what work I did, as long as I had plenty of free time after it. So I always had work and gave my conscientious all, but I never took the work thing seriously as a career prospect. I had no thoughts of progressing into management and boardrooms and all that jazz. It is anything but jazz to me. In my head I was a drifter with plenty of free time. Then aged 28 in 1979, it was not Lord's Cricket Ground, but the Lord himself who got me. I stopped playing cricket in 1983. My passion for writing had overtaken my enjoyment of cricket. Fifteen years later, I received a phone call asking if I'd do some coaching at the club. I declined, which I regret now. I should have said yes. Having any competence only in the arts and failing spectacularly in sciences, all my interest and creativity have been in art forms. In one of my handwritten journals, I made a list of art forms that I admire in others' genius. Writing, music, painting, sculpture, classical ballet, ironsmithing, floristry, carpentry. I know a world-famous carpenter from Nazareth. And a few other forms, 
I included, obviously, cricket. Cricket is a curious side-on game. Most people just can't do it. They lift the back bat forwards with no back lift and they do that before they move the feet and the head is lifted so their eyes don't properly see the ball. You only have to watch a batsman face two deliveries and you can see if he's got it or not. The same with bowling, except with the bowler you only need to see one delivery or just watch the run up. I might see just one delivery and if I'm impressed I want to watch more. I particularly enjoy watching spin bowling and even more especially left arm spin bowling, spin bowling being an art form all in itself. As chance and fortune would now have it, I lived the other side of the road from the pitch of the last team my father played for. From my bedroom window I can see the pitch before the leaves come out on the trees and block my view. In my mind's eye I see flickers of the ghost of my father calling for a quick single, his face always burnished from his thousands of hours playing cricket since a boy. He would give Martin and me lessons there, his matches rattling in his jacket pocket. I once opened the batting for Petersfield, a position I didn't favour. The opposition had a high-class, tall Indian spinner who rattled through us. We were all out for about 80. I couldn't score against his pinpoint accuracy, but I was determined he wouldn't get me out, and he didn't. I carried my bat for 19 not out. A flimsy score, but if my partners had lasted longer, I might have scored more. We carry these memories and figures in our heads, and they never go. I remember being given out LBW when I was trying to glance the ball down the leg side. I remarked on it afterwards to the umpire, and his response was, it was a dick shot. I have not yet found that in cricket's laws. I remember being given not out in a court behind appeal when I knew I had gloved the ball. I remember being given not out in a run-out appeal when I felt sure I was out. I remember landing the ball in a tennis court during an evening match when I got 50. I dropped the most simple of catches off the bowling of one of my close friends. Cricket commentator and poet John Arlott wrote this of Jack Hobbs. If he had never scored a run or excelled in any sport, those who knew him must have seen him as a great man because of the unmistakable nobility of his character. I would say the same of my father. Martin and I lived under his shadow in the town. Everybody loved Ray Sparks. When he died, the local paper carried a headline, Town Mourns Ray. A year after his death in 1993, which caused me a breakdown, I wrote this poem. First anniversary of my father's death. There's an old cine film from 1954 of him, riding home from school on his motorised pedal cycle. Even when he was dressed in a suit, his jet black, swept back hair always looked as if he'd just ridden home against the wind. But like his perfect batting stance at the crease, eyes level, bat tucked behind the feet, shoulders sloping like Jack Hobbs, he always held his poise. One New Year's Eve he lassoed us home from a party in a skittle bar with some of his sociable pu pupils, and we were in the kitchen raging in a family row. A friend knocked on the veranda door and let himself straight in. He was that sort, and he'd obviously heard the shouting. My father paced about, coughing in his palms, and said, Hello, Neil, we're just rehearsing Hamlet. And everybody burst out laughing. He was the classic romantic schoolmaster, 
hating the bells and corridors and timetables. He went on about the dreaming spires of Oxford, imagining he'd missed some higher station. With his blue eyes focused in the distance, as he puffed away at the pipe hooked underneath an aquiline nose, he'd sit and think and gaze at nothing, and someone had to ask my mother, what does Ray do all day? He harped on about an age of elegance when people whistled tuneful songs. Sometimes he'd let his fine baritone voice break out into one of those vintage songs like Good Night Vienna. Days before he died, he received a letter from a lifelong friend who wrote, You taught me that gentleness is not a weakness. For his gravestone epitaph, my mother found these words of a poem by Hilaire Belloc. The grace of God is in courtesy. So stands the little monument in the cemetery bearing those words above him. Hard to conceive of it now that all of this was only twelve months ago, that just twelve months back he was with us. With a shaking heart I delivered his funeral tribute to a crowded St Mary's church in Sheet. I didn't break until the final syllable, then descended the steps of the high pulpit with hands clenched across my face. A narrative I recounted in my tribute was how in his dying weeks I spoke to him about the day when he was over sixty and was persuaded to make a comeback in the county league for Petersfield cricket team. We played against some South Coast eleven who turned up with two young athletes who bounced the ball above our heads like Dennis Lilly and Jeff Thompson on a rock-hard wicket. I'd already been dismissed when Dad's time came to bat lower down the order. I was frightened for him, but as he was going out he whispered in my ear, Right, Chris, watch this. He walked out angry with the sleeves of his mind rolled up, and his bat was a bloodthirsty axe, and he slashed and carved and hooked it through those southern warriors and rolled them on the ancient burial mounds of the heath. He said he couldn't remember it, and only asked, How many did I get? I still have dreams of playing for England, and why shouldn't I? The club I retired from was Steep, the village that was home to the poet Edward Thomas. I've drawn a few pointless little cartoons of cricketers, the more serious is a cartoon hanging in the Steep Cricket Club pavilion. A patient with depression is telling his doctor that those antidepressant drugs have helped him in nothing. The doctor scribbles something, hands the patient a slip of paper, a prescription. The patient stares at it for a while, then asks, All right then. Where exactly is this steep cricket club?